Okay, so first off, um, thank you all for coming. Um, love doing these things from the convenience of our own homes or offices. Um, as Janice said, I will be teaching an in-person um, class this weekend. Uh, it's my very famous, uh, the fine art of digital printmaking class. And I will talk about that a little later on. In the presentation, it is a full two day class on everything you ever wanted to know about printing with real live printing going on. And uh, we have partnered uh, with Contact LA Photo Lab in the brewery to conduct that workshop. And I will be going there on Friday to set things up and get the classroom situation all squared away. So um, to start, um, I like to make just a few announcements and caveats because this is being recorded. And one of the things in my daily life that I'm always battling is misinformation and old information. So I want to say today is June 1st, 2022. If you look back at this video 10 years from now, <laughs> the information might have changed a little bit. And uh, so I'm constantly getting people telling me about a video they saw and how great it was. And I'm like, yeah, but it was 10 years old and it's, everything's different now. So just always be mindful on the internet um, of where, you know, you're getting your information from and how old it is and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and I always say when I start any of my classes that, um, uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question. The dumb question is the one that you didn't ask. And I can assure you that there are other people that have exactly the same question. And I have um, spent my career uh, traveling around the country and doing workshops, darkroom and digital. And uh, I focused my, my career in the last 10 or 12 years uh, on digital fine art print ma printmaking. And I can tell you with absolute confidence that I could be in a room filled of 50 beginning photo students who were in the first semester asking very basic questions. And then the next day I'll be in a room with 50 of the top professionals in the world and they'll ask the same questions. I can tell you with confidence that the education that this industry has provided for digital fine art printing is not the best. Uh, and I am here to help you through this process. So I am going to share my screen. So this is a class that I have developed over the course of the past year, which is really what I say is kind of the introduction uh, to digital fine art printing. It is the six things you need to know to prepare yourself for printing. And without these steps, um, you're going to be making some sort of sacrifice in your workflow. So this is called the six steps to making perfect inkjet prints. Um, as Janice introduced me, I am Eric Joseph. I am a co-president of Freestyle Photographic and Imaging Supplies, uh, and uh, which basically means I'm part of the executive management team. But I also am very, very focused um, every day on helping people be successful with digital fine art printmaking. Uh, Freestyle, for those of you who may not know who we are, uh, we have a store based in Hollywood, California. We're on Sunset near Western. We also have a distribution center in Santa Fe Springs, California. And the, while the bulk of our business is mail order, and we've always been known for that, we do have a retail store that services the local LA market. Um, and you see our logo at the bottom of the screen, along with our website. Our website is chock full of lots of information, uh, both darkroom and digital. And um, again, for those of you who may not know who we are or what we do, we're not a consumer electronics company. You're not really going to come to us for cameras and lenses and the latest in lighting and electronic gadgets. Uh, if we you know, were to kind of synthesize the description of our company into an easy um, concise description is we are, we sell the products that people use to make a print on a piece of paper, whether it's darkroom or digital. So we still sell film, uh, paper and chemicals. We're the largest seller of black and white film, paper and chemicals in the world. 
surprisingly enough, during the pandemic, we our number one sales category is, in terms of product is color film. It is just astounding how much color film has increased in sales in the past couple of years. And then for me, I spend most of my days, like I said, working with people on digital fine art printing and everything related to it. And this is going to be a great overview for everybody in terms of getting an understanding of, of what you need to do to prepare. So here we go. So here's the six steps we're going to talk about today. Um, first is uh, a monitor. Monitor is super important. Um, many of my customers have Apple computers and Apple laptops. Uh, unfortunately, Apple does not make products, contrary to what people think, they don't make their products for people who want to print images on a piece of paper. Uh, everything about Apple computers is about video and rendering video. And um, we're going to talk about some of the differences in monitors and what at least my recommendations are for a monitor. Uh, it's really critical to have one that is appropriate for editing still images for printing, which is what we're talking about. Uh, calibrating a monitor is important. Uh, color management, the two words that strike fear, you know, in the hearts of most photographers. Um, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to try to simply explain it and demystify some of it for you and show you why it's important. Without a having a, the right monitor and calibrating your monitor, you're kind of doomed for failure. The, um, the reality is that Apple monitors are very bright, they're very contrasty, and they're very flattering. They're designed to make everything look great, and they're designed for basically watching movies uh, streaming from iTunes, but they're not really appropriate for editing an image that you're going to look at on a piece of paper. So the third thing is, in fact, paper. I spend a lot of time in my classes and with customers um, and uh, potential clients talking about paper. To me, paper is the most important part of this process. We carry brands from Arista 2, which is our private label, Awagami, which is a 300-year-old Japanese washi uh, style paper mill in Japan, Canson Infinity, um, which is one of our premier brands from France. Uh, and they have some papers that are his of historical significance in the art world. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, Epson, of course, which most people know, uh, they are a printer manufacturer. And um, they also have a full line of very good papers. Um, contrary to what most people think, Epson is not a paper manufacturer. Um, but they do make papers that if you buy an Epson printer in the driver, it's the name of the paper. It's kind of an easy choice to make, but there, you can put actually any paper in an Epson printer, or you could put Epson paper in a Canon printer or vice versa. Uh, Hanamule, another one of our premier brands from Germany, they are actually now celebrating 25 years of the invention of fine art digital printing. Uh, Photorag 308 was their uh, was the paper that kind of started all of this in terms of having uh, a paper that of as any sort of reasonable archival permanence um, and it is really the standard by which all other smooth matte papers are measured and they have a great full line of papers and we're we'll talking about those. Um, certainly Ilford is a brand that many people know, especially from the darkroom times. Uh, it is a different company now. It's separate from uh, the darkroom company, the darkroom papers are made by Harman Technologies, but they do share a brand and they've got a full range of paper. Uh, Innova is another brand that we carry, not as well known here on the West Coast, but certainly more well known in the Midwest and the East Coast. They have some papers that are very interesting. And uh, Moab, which is also very popular. Their Entrada paper is a, probably the most popular pro pro paper they have. Uh, and all of their marketing and such um, are names uh, from the Southwest. So we'll be talking a bit about paper as well. Uh, printers, we'll have a brief discussion about printers, uh, Canon printers, Epson printers, desktop printers, large format printers, uh, using uh, custom paper and printer, uh, paper printer profiles 
is an important part of the process too, in order to get the maximum results. And we'll talk about those versus generic profiles. And then the last topic will be lighting. And lighting is absolutely critical. And we're talking about the lighting that you're gonna view your print under. Um, and I find that this is one of the key points of failure in the entire process. And um, I think the most common question that I get um, is my prints have come out too dark. What do I do? Um, I don't think I've ever had somebody come to me and say my prints are too light. Um, I don't think it's ever happened, <laughs> but usually it's too dark. And it's because the light you're viewing the prints under is too dark. Um, so we'll talk about all of this. Now, um, this is really about preparation. It's about setting yourself up for success. And uh, you don't have to do all of these things. Um, um, and I really, you know, when people ask me, what do I have to have? What do I need to do? Well, have to have and need to have are very strong, powerful concepts. To me, it's what do you want to do? And if you have a problem, understanding these six things will help you solve that problem. Um, but just remember, if you don't have the right monitor, your monitor's not calibrated, you're not using the right paper, you know, any, any one of these things, if you skip, you're going to be making a sacrifice. Uh, so just remember that as we go through this. So the brand of monitor that I recommend um, that we carry is BenQ. Um, and specifically their SW series monitors. They make a lot of different monitors for a lot of different markets. But this particular series is the series that is designed around somebody who wants to make a print on a piece of paper. So this series, um, their Adobe RGB 1998 color space. The, this color space is um, built around the uh, ink that we have on our digital fine art printers. Right, so these all of these printers, um, they're not P3 color space like Apple monitors. Uh, P3 is the digital video color space. They're not sRGB like many of the gaming monitors. Um, having the right color space is going to solve a lot of your problems with colors uh, not matching. Uh, these monitors also have a flat matte coating on them. So you're not seeing a lot of reflections. They're not going to be as contrasty as an Apple display. Um, they also come with a viewing hood. So that hood focuses your eyes on what you're doing. You're not seeing everything that's behind the monitor. So um, the, this is a piece of equipment that for me is critical in terms of something who wants to make a, you know, edit images for the purpose of printing on a piece of paper. And you can connect them to your uh, Apple notebook. You can, um, you can plug them into your iMac. Uh, you can use it as a separate monitor. Um, I here in my home office, uh, I have a Mac mini. I have two BenQ monitors plugged into my Mac mini. I also have an Apple, uh, a new M1 uh, MacBook Pro 14 inch and um, I use it all the time, but I only use it if I'm editing images, if I'm going to post them on the web. Um, it doesn't really matter. I don't really know what you're looking at on the internet, right? I don't know if your monitor is too dark or too light or too green, too red, too blue. I'm just doing basic editing for that. But if I'm going to print, I'm going to plug it into my BenQ monitor, and I'm going to be using that as my reference because it is going to be much more accurate. Now, the one that is uh, the most popular that I recommend the most is this one, is the SW270C. So this is a 27 inch uh, standard resolution monitor. They're $800. And the, the really nice thing about it is that um, it connects to your Apple laptop via a USB-C connector. All of this C, um, uh, monitors, the ones with the letter C after them, the USB-C connector actually provides power and data. 
So when I plug this monitor into my laptop, it's actually providing power. So I don't have the, I don't have to have my laptop plugged into a separate power supply. There's also a hub on the rear left side of the printer of the monitor that um, adds two additional USB 3.0 ports and an SD card slot, which is also very convenient. Many oftentimes when I'm doing workshops, I'll just plug the USB plug from the printer right into the monitor. So it's providing data. Um, and again, it's the right color space for what we need for, um, for editing images. Now, there are some competing brands that people like. NEC is one, ISO, EIZO is another one. And those are great monitors, um, but they are more expensive. So BenQ provides for at least my customers, uh, the value proposition, right? You're getting a really great monitor for a price that's very reasonable. Now, as you go up in price, the SW271C, basically the same as the 270C, um, they're twice as much, but it is now a 4K monitor. You don't need 4K to edit still images for printing. You only need 4K if you're gonna edit video. Uh, it's a video standard. It doesn't really provide you with any benefit in editing still images in Photoshop and Lightroom. And the problem is with, the, um, with Photoshop and Lightroom, the operating system doesn't scale. So all the tools and everything get really small at 4K. Um, I've used 4K monitors and I literally have to back the resolution off to two and a half K, um, which is standard resolution in order for me to use Photoshop and Lightroom. And then there is a 32 inch monitor or 31 and a half inch really. Um, and it's really nice and big. It gives you lots of real estate on one monitor. Uh, and it is 4K. And for uh, 1999, uh, there isn't a better value on the market. You'll pay at least twice as much uh, for an NEC or an ISO monitor. So those are your three primary choices. They do make a small 24 inch monitor for those for portability, but it isn't USB C, it uses the older connectors. So you might have to get some adapters. Um, and then there is, we have a couple left of the SW271, a 4K monitor for 1099, which is a great value, but the USB-C cable doesn't provide power. So we have a couple of those left that's discontinued. So, um, okay, so here's some things to think about as we move forward. Uh, photography has always been a combination of art and science. Color management is the science. So we're going to talk about color management a bit now. And what I mean by it's been a, always been a combination of art and science is that photography, you know, we're very dependent upon technology. Um, to me, the art part is your ability to capture an image that you're so proud of that you want to show it, you want to share it, you want to sell it. And then, of course, um, how you want to present it, whether it's a print, whether it's on uh, projected, uh, whether it's going to be on the internet, whatever. Those are the choices you make that are creative. Now, color management is science. It's just math. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to understand. Um, but, you, you know, what settings do you put on your monitor? What settings are on your camera? Uh, what settings do you choose in the print driver? You know, all of these things, these are all science. There's really no art to printing. The art part is your ability to capture an image and then your paper choice. The in-between stuff, that's all the science part. And that's what I help people with. Um, so the color management is what allows us to achieve what I call predictable, consistent, reliable, repeatable, and controllable results. It's really important to understand color management so that when you push that button on your on your printer and you go I want to make a print what comes out of the printer is within 90 percent I say 90 percent what it looks like on your monitor it's never going to be perfect okay so this is one of the great myths of printing that people kind of assume because they're only looking at what's in front of them so your file is on your computer okay and then it gets sent over to the monitor, okay? Gets on the computer, gets sent to the monitor. It's also on the computer and it gets sent to the printer. So there is absolutely no connection between your monitor and your printer. 
those two devices have been created with different technologies. They speak different languages. And when we calibrate a monitor and we create custom profiles for a printer, what we're doing is calibrating and profiling to a standard. And the standard is um, been set up by the International, International Color Consortium. You know, whenever you see a profile, you see that dot ICC at the end of the file. That stands for International Color Consortium. And essentially every color has a numeric value associated with it. And when we're profiling, when we're calibrating, we're basically creating, uh, what's in my next slide here? It's like creating a prescription pair of glasses. So, um, so the analogy I like to use to help people really understand what's going on here is that um, profiles are the difference between how your monitor or your printer is representing color and then how, as opposed to how it's supposed to according to the standards set up by the ICC. It's essentially a mathematical equation. And my analogy is this, you go to the eye doctor, you take a test or they put you in this machine now and it creates your prescription. Your prescription is a profile. It's the difference between how your eyes see and how they're supposed to see according to the medical standard of 2020 vision. That's it. Now, if you think about it, I'm, I'm wearing glasses. And, what, and if you wear glasses and I give you my glasses, what are the odds we had the same prescription? Be pretty rare, right? So essentially, when you go to a manufacturer's website like Hanamula or Canson or, or uh, Moab and you download their generic profile, to me, that's like going to Walgreens or CVS and getting reader glasses, right? It's going to get you close. Maybe it's going to be better, but it's not going to be perfect, Right. A prescription pair of glasses, that's perfect. And it's how your eyes are when you took the test. Now, I go back to the eye doctor every year, and they test my eyes. And sometimes they change, sometimes they don't. But if I have a new, if they recommend a new prescription, guess what? That's my new calibration, right? So it's important to do it from time to time so that, uh, because your your monitor will drift over time. So, so profiles are not to be ignored. Obviously, when you get your monitor and plug it in, <clears throat> yes, it is calibrated at the factory to a certain specification, but over time it will drift. It will change in brightness and color. So it's important to calibrate your monitor from time to time. And... <clears throat> With that, this is the monitor calibration device that I recommend. There are many on the market. This is the one that works. Um, and I guarantee it. In fact, I have gone to the extent of when you buy one of these devices, it comes with a step-by-step -step instruction manual that you can only get at Freestyle. That, uh, and it's written by me. And it's, um, it's about 27 pages, but it's not little lines of text, it's big screenshots with big circles and arrows that says, push this button, go to the next page. Go to this page, do this, this, and this, click this button, go to the next page. It's very step-by-step. -step. It I've written it so that somebody who has no idea how to calibrate a monitor will be successful. And of course, if you do have problems, guess what? You get to call me. Now, yes, there are some less expensive devices on the market, I just don't feel they work. I've tried them. There's no way to validate the calibration. And many oftentimes the manufacturers set the validation variance so high, your monitor can still be pretty far off and it will still pass. This device, you know, the devices starting at this price point allow you to verify and validate your um, calibration. So this is the device that I recommend. There is a more expensive device called the Calibrite Color Checker Display Plus. They're $319. Um, not really relevant for what most of us need a calibration device for. 
the sensor is a little more um, a little more accurate, but it's actually designed for monitors that are very bright. So if you're going to get a, a try to calibrate a monitor is up to two thousand nits, um, yeah, get the more expensive device. Um, but for what we're doing, when we're calibrating our monitors for editing images for printing, we're really at 120 nits. Um, or if you've looked in, uh, if you've had any experience with calibration, you'll see that it's measured in candelas, CD slash M squared. Um, it's really the same as a nit, same as a lux, same as a lumen. So um, nit is kind of a new term for us photographers. It's uh, been used in the video market for a very long time. So you notice that this is called Calibrite, and I've got a big um, statement on there. It's previously X-Rite. So many of you probably know X-Rite as, as a brand that's been around for a long time. They, a year ago, um, they're celebrating a year of the switchover in the branding for this product. So if you have an older X-Rite i1 Display Pro or Plus, uh, it will work with the software from Calibrite. Uh, X-Rite has simply just moved this product over to a new company. Uh, X-Rite owns Pantone, so they're still very much in business, but they want to sell the products that are sold into the other market channels that are a lot more expensive. So um, Mac Group and, um, and the engineer, many of the software engineers have formed a new company that continues selling and supporting this product. Uh, far into the future. So the software has been updated for Monterey and M1 Silicon, um, and it works great. It's a device that I use, and certainly for me, what I would consider the minimum in terms of uh, a device that you should use to be calibrating your monitor. Eric, um, yes. you have quite a few questions in the chat. Do you want me to keep interrupting you, or should we just do um, it at the end? I love it when you interrupt me. It's well, irrelevant here right you now. go, Let's do sir. It. All right. Okay. This one is from Peter. I've selected Adobe 1998 as my color profile on MacBook Pro. Do I need a standalone monitor? You've chosen Adobe RGB 1998. So you're talking uh, uh, in your... In your display preferences, you've chosen Adobe RGB 1998, Peter? Okay, so if you're in display preferences and you've chosen Adobe RGB 1998, you are not viewing your monitor in Adobe RGB 1998. That is a reference file that Adobe and Lightroom use to create your, your, your file. So it is not a monitor calibration. It is not a monitor profile. If you click, I'm assuming you're doing this on an Apple computer? Yes. So if you click the box that says show only profiles for this monitor, it'll disappear. The problem with that display preferences panel is that it's showing you like every profile in your system. So Apple monitors are not Adobe RGB 1998. And I've got coming up here in a couple of slides, you're a little ahead of me. Um, I'm gonna show you the difference. At newer Apple displays are all P3 color space. It's a different color space than Adobe RGB 1998. Um, and so it isn't really appropriate for printing. It's beautiful though. I mean, it is wide gamut, it's very big and it makes everything look flattering but it's a digital video color space. So you've made uh, I pass no judgment, um, but it's a mistake that a lot of people make because they see it there, but they don't really understand what it is. So what you should be doing is reverting back to Apple's, um, uh, it'll say, I don't know if you have an iMac or a notebook, it'll see LCD or whatever, revert back to Apple's generic uh, profile. You haven't done anything. You can't change the technology that the monitor was built with, okay? So that's just a reference file. So, so what does this uh, display profile do then? Well, that's not a display profile. Your, the generic one is the one that, you know, if you have a new Apple computer, the monitor is kind of calibrated at the factory, right? So all monitors have a generic profile 
that they use initially. And then when you create a profile with this device, it overrides that profile and provides more accuracy because your monitor will drift over time in terms of color and brightness. Okay, Eric, um, you have next. more questions. Do you still, okay. yeah, okay. Yeah, Cindy, let's take another one. Okay, Cindy asks, how often do you have to calibrate monitors? Um, again, there's that word have to. So I like to take that out. Um, I generally tell people to calibrate your monitor once a month. Um, now, um, I have some people, you can do it all the time if you want. I have some people that calibrate multiple times a day. I think they're a little crazy. I have people that will wear a black ski mask and a, and a hoodie because they're worried about the reflections of their face in the monitor and how that's going to affect their perception of color. I think that's a bit overkill. Um, what I don't want you to do is buy a device like this for $280 and set it up. And then two years later, call me and say, hey, my monitor looks really off. Um, what's going on here? And then I look on your system and see you calibrated it two years ago when we originally installed it. Um, monitors drift over time dramatically and you don't see it. It happens so subtly over time that um, by the time you notice it's off, it's too late, right? So um, for me, I say get in a good habit of doing it once a month or when you're going to print, right? Because that's when it matters. If you're looking at your spreadsheets, your email, or looking at images on Facebook or Instagram, it doesn't matter. But it really matters when you're going to print, right? That's when it matters. So um, two rules, when you're going to print or once a month. Um, don't let it go longer than that. So we have three color spaces available to us that we use when we're creating images in Photoshop or Lightroom. The first one is sRGB. Uh, the S stands for standard RGB. This was our first color space. It was created by Microsoft in 1994 uh, for the purpose of getting all of our CRT monitors under control. Um, back then we had those big monitors with big backs on them and the big tubes in them. And they noticed that, you know, when they were creating all this technology and they're creating proofing systems, especially for the printing industry, they would go into the room where people were editing and all their monitors were all over the place. Well, that's not acceptable in the printing industry. You need to be exact. So they created standards. The first standard was sRGB. Um, the color space that you see there on the left, that is the maximum space that color film can render. So um, it was designed to accurately represent the maximum amount of color that the color film technology could render. So if you are sending your images to an online printing service, they generally will want sRGB files. Um, if you're printing on chromogenic paper or C prints, or some companies are now calling them photo prints, this is the same type of a chemical-based product, you know, paper that you would have used, you know, gotten from a mini lab. That technology still exists. It's still the least expensive way of making uh, quality photographic prints. Uh, the maximum color space that that material, that media can handle is sRGB. So it's totally appropriate, um, but it is the smaller of our color spaces that we use. So Adobe RGB 1998, you see in the middle, uh, is the wireframe. So the colored space is sRGB. Adobe RGB, RGB 1998 is the wireframe, and you'll see it's 35% bigger. Uh, oh, by the way, sRGB was also optimized for skin tone. So a lot of wedding and portrait photographer, photographers use sRGB. Um, and it doesn't mean you're not going to get bright colors. You are. I mean, you can get bright, saturated colors out of sRGB. Um, and I like to take the judgment out of it as well. Just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's worse. It's appropriate for certain things. And, um, you know, especially, you know, I, I had a guy recently that's doing sports photography and he was shooting JPEGs and he had to shoot fast. Couldn't wait for the camera to process raw images. So, all of these choices we have are just choices based on what we 
want to and need to do for the work that we're doing. So Adobe RGB 1998 was in fact created in 1998 by Adobe as a standard for digital fine art printmaking. And that happens to be the, where the colors in our printer line up in terms of if we had a paper that could render all the color in Adobe RGB 1998, that's where all the colors would be. Unfortunately, our limitation is really the paper and the media in terms of um, total color gamut. But Adobe RGB 1998 is our standard and it is good for skin tones, it's good for landscapes and all around just pictorial photography. Um, and then on the far right, you're basically seeing a graphic that's two dimensional instead of three dimensional. So the colored space in the middle shows um, sRGB and the wireframe around it is Adobe RGB 1998. Now we have a third color space that's a bit controversial um, it's called ProPhoto RGB. It was, um, it's a theoretical color space. It was created by uh, Dr. Jeff Wolf at Kodak. Uh, and it was first uh, described in an article in 2011. And this guy now works for Canon in Australia. And it's a really, really big color space. Unfortunately, there isn't a, a monitor yet that can render that much color. And there isn't um, a printer that can print it. So while it's it's good, you know, I have a lot of people that use it because they're pushing their colors out and they need the what we call the headroom in the file in order to do certain editing and stuff. But the reality is we can't see it on any monitor and we can't print it. So for printing, it's really overkill. Now, I, I do a lot of classes and a lot of talks. And every once in a while, I get somebody in my class that says things like, well, as far as I'm concerned, if you're not, you know, working and saving your file in pro photo, I don't consider you a real photographer. And I'm like, that kind of just proves to me you don't know what it really means. The reality is that you're not getting any benefit from it from a printing standpoint. If you're in black and white, um, if you looked at the color space of a file in black and white, these um, graphs I'm showing you are what's called a lab scale, right? And so L in the lab is straight up and down. So the top is white, the bottom is black. A is um, magenta to cyan and B is yellow to blue. So every color you see in these graphs has specific LAB coordinate associated with it. And um, the thing is, is that when we're printing, you're never going to get really beyond Adobe RGB 1998. I mean, there are some colors that might push out into the yellows and oranges, but they don't occur in nature and you're rarely ever going to see them. So your pro photo RGB files are huge. If you have a black and white image, you would see no color. It would just be a line of gray going from the top of L down to the bottom of L. Right. So, so, you know, um, I also have people who use pro photo because they say things like, well, in the future, if we do have a monitor that's going to be able to render those colors and we do have a printer, I'm going to be happy. I have those colors. Well, you probably don't have those colors. Right. But also there's no way to really verify it uh, on your monitor or your printer because we can't see them. We can't render them. So it's really, to me, too big for printing. But of course, if you want to use it, by all means, go ahead if you feel that it's doing something for you. So now we're going to get more to Peter's question here, which is monitor color spaces. So um, here is the difference between P3 and Adobe RGB 1998. So the colored space that you're seeing on the left versus the wireframe, the color <laughs> is um, Adobe RGB 1998 and the wireframe is P3. So I've had customers that have come to me and said, look, here's my file on my MacBook Pro and I've got this bright red streak in it. But when I print it, it comes out rust. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, 
Well, you're looking at it on P3 monitor and it's got more going for it out in the color that you have here. Now let's take the same file and look at it on a BenQ monitor. And when I look at it in the BenQ monitor, it looks exactly how it's printing. So the color is shifted. You don't have a choice. If your monitor is P3, you can't change it to Adobe RGB 1998. It's just the way Apple has, and, and, and many Windows machines, uh, from a technology standpoint, have been set up. They, they're set up for the 95% of the population that wants to watch movies on their computer. Um, also, the web is starting to kind of standardize for P3, although most people still upload images in sRGB. <clears throat> so what we're showing, what I'm trying to show you here is the difference in just where the color is in a P3 monitor versus Adobe RGB 1998. And if you look at the, um, the calibrated um, files that are on the right, you'll see um, Adobe RGB 1998, and then I've calibrated my BenQ monitor and how that calibration lies right on Adobe RGB 1998. And then the same thing with my MacBook Pro where I have calibrated it and you see how that calibration is lying right on P3 color space. So it is two different things. And again, by choosing that Adobe RGB 1998 reference file, you're not making your monitor Adobe RGB 1998 because the technology is already locked in to P3. So uh, any other questions related to color management, Janice? Is the Spider X good enough for the time being or should she purchase the Calibrite? Um, she's a beginner printer. Okay, so um, again, should all these you know, words you know, very, you know, um, I like to avoid words like that. The reality is the whole point of all of this is to create predictability. Now, I do not carry the spider uh, device from data color. I've tried them. I haven't been happy with them. I could have gotten a bad one. They weren't very responsive in helping me. To this day, they have not been responsive in helping me. And I'm the guy, right? So, um, Calibrite, very responsive. Um, uh, for me, if that device is working for you and it's calibrating your monitor and it's giving you what you need and what you see coming out of your printer <laughs> looks like what's on your monitor within 90%, continue to use it. Um, I just know Calibrite is a better product and a more consistent product. But again, if it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, yeah, get the Calibrite device. Absolutely. Could I interrupt just briefly, Eric? It's Allison Ely. I wrote the question. Um, I purchased. Hi, <laughs> How are you? Thank you for your Great. time. Um, sure. So I have the ISO. All of this equipment was recommended by one of my teachers. So okay. I, I'm not. I'm haven't had my monitor calibrated since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So I don't really know. And I'm also not uh, experienced enough to really know what's working and what's not working. I have to spend time getting a print where I want it to be, but eventually it gets there. Um, I am retired and worked all my life so I can afford $300. So for someone who isn't in a position just yet to be able to make that determination, should I, you know, I have the sure color. I think it's, is it 800 or 1800? I think it's- So the, so the P800, um, yeah, two years ago, that was the current model. Right, the new one is the P900, and right. they're great printers. Um, you know, this is a situation that I'd like to, you know, first of all, as we go through the rest of this presentation, your more questions will be answered. Um, but uh, I'm also gonna, you know, uh, I think, Janice, can you put my email address in the chat and it'll appear at other points throughout the pro, uh, throughout the presentation as well? Absolutely. Some of these questions could be best um, answered offline. The bottom line is calibrate your monitor, right? Use the, use the device, follow the directions. If what's coming out of your printer within 90% looks like what's on your monitor, you're good. My problem with the uh, spider was my monitor was seriously cyan and I couldn't get rid of it, no matter what I did. There wasn't a software or hardware solution that they provided me that, that worked. So I knew the monitor wasn't calibrated. 
but I have people that do buy that device and are pretty happy with it. It's kind of hit and miss though. Um, I've heard that the hardware is a bit uh, inconsistent from one to the other. And that's kind of the main issue with it. So um, I am hesitant to say, yes, buy this, it will solve your problem. You could have some other problems, right? But that's what we're here. That's why we're talking about this stuff. Sorry, Erica, there's okay. one more question. It, uh, this question okay. is from Pat. How do I know okay. if my Apple monitor is P3? Um, if it uh, is later than mid-2015, it is P3. So before mid-2015, Apple monitors were sRGB, and they adopted the P3 standard after that. So they're all P3 after that. So, and if you look up the original specs of it, um, Apple will tell you. Okay, so, um, so, so we've covered the first two, monitor, monitor calibration. Now we're gonna talk about paper. Now this is my favorite topic. Um, paper, uh, my conversation on paper is very unique in I think the computer and printing world because most people think, hey, you, everybody wants to get the monitor, right? They want the monitor, it looks great. They want the printer, it looks impressive. Um, I find that people in photography many oftentimes suffer from something that I call gas. It's, uh, it's, I think it's a pretty common term now. We call it gear acquisition syndrome. And people want all this stuff that's going to make them look cool. But the reality is, if you're going to make a print on a piece of paper, the most important thing you really need to think about is paper. Um, and as you can see behind me, um, you know, I, I talk about paper a lot. And I think it's the most exciting part of this process. And it allows you to create a unique artistic signature in your work more than anything else. So, um, and it is the art part of this whole process is making that decision. So, um, so the factors to consider when you're thinking about paper are um, number one, um, what type? We have basically two types of paper, one I call general purpose, uh, photo grade, which are all your resin coated papers and your inexpensive matte papers. Uh, and then you have fine art papers. Fine art papers are always going to give you better quality images. They're going to look you have more depth, more dimension, more three-dimensional. And when you start factoring in things like surface texture and base tone, whether it's a cool paper or warm paper, um, you could talk about papers that have what I would call a more exotic uh, pulp uh, beyond cotton, right? We have bamboo and kozo and hemp and agave and sugarcane and um, and all sorts of other papers are made out of all sorts of things. Then there's the thickness of the paper, right? How does it feel in your hand? Um, that's measured in mils or microns. We'll talk a bit about that. And then then there's branding, right? People ask me about many off brands of paper and um, versus a Canson or a Hanamula or a Moab or a name brand, right? And that ends up being part of your branding. Uh, and then of course, uh, papers available in sheets and rolls, some in small sheets, some in larger, you know, there's every brand has kind of a mix um, um, of what papers are available and what. Some papers are available from four by six all the way up to 60 inch rolls. Some of them aren't in small sheets. Um, but sometimes, for instance, I'll have labs that say, I don't want to bring a paper in unless it's available in 60 inch rolls, because I don't want to get somebody started on a product that is um, uh, only going to be up to 44 inches. So sometimes that's a determining factor. Um, weight, grams per square meter, we will talk about that. To me, an irrelevant number. It doesn't mean anything, yet it's on every single box of paper. And then it's all based on personal taste. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go through uh, some examples of what these papers are. So to start getting yourself familiar with them. So in the photo grade general purpose resin coated paper category, this would be papers that are glossy, luster, pearl, could even be metallic, right? So we have 
our Arista 2 photo grade luster. We also have it as a glossy. We have the same type of papers also in a metallic version. So they have like a little shimmer to them. Uh, Canson Infinity also, all these brands have like a, a glossy and a luster. But Canson also has this interesting paper called Photo Satin Premium RC that's very smooth and the ink on the paper has no texture. So when we talk about a luster paper, that would be more like Kodak's E surface, right? Glossy would be like Kodak F. This is the only paper I've really found that is like Kodak N surface. And by the way, these are all images that I've taken and printed on these papers. And when I do my very famous World of Inkjet Paper presentation, I literally have a portfolio where all of these images, um, I have over 200 prints, all printed 11 by 17. Um, and, um, and when I present, do that presentation, you get to touch and feel all these papers. So Epson, uh, this is Epson Premium Photo Paper for Glossy. We also have Luster and Semi-Gloss and other papers. Hana Mule has uh, a Glossy, a Pearl, and a Luster. Um, Ilford also has a you know, Smooth Gloss, through Smooth Pearl. And then um, this is a Moab Slick Rock Pearl. So Moab, uh, when they call it their, their Slick Rock Pearl, is really a Glossy resin-coated paper. Um, but it's metallic and it has a bit of a shimmering quality to the base. So they call it based on, you know, they call it, kind of call it out based on the pearlescent quality of the base. So these are all images that when I shoot, I'm thinking about what paper I'm going to print on. So I very much think of paper as part of my composition on every image that I create. So uh, in addition to general purpose resin coated papers, um, there's also inexpensive matte papers. And some of these are single sided, some of them are double sided. So this is our Arista 2 uh, Duo matte. Arista 2 is our private label brand. Arista is a registered trademark of freestyle. So if you ever see product out there in the world under the Arista name in the photo industry, it's not part of Arista Records. Um, it is our registered trademark. So we do have a double-sided matte paper that's um, relatively uh, heavyweight. Um, this is my badass squirrel from St. James Park in London who dared me to take his picture. Um, uh, we also have a double-weight matte paper. So this would be a single-sided paper. And when I'm talking about single-sided and double-sided, double-sided means you could print on both sides. Single-sided means there's only one side that's coded for inkjet to accept the ink. And if you print on the wrong side of like a resin coated paper, you know, we've all done it, I've done it. You know, the ink goes on the back and it kind of looks like a Van Gogh painting and the ink never dries. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but not necessarily what you're going for. So you gotta be careful as to which side's which. Um, same thing with matte papers and those papers are a little uh, harder to determine what the printable side is. You'd like to think that the manufacturers put the paper face up in the box, or at least, you know, they have a little note in there that says print this side up. Well, every once in a while, paper goes in upside down. So um, I have two tests that I do. Uh, one is a post-it note test. So you take a post-it note and the stick them on the back of the note, you put it on both sides of the paper. It will generally stick more to the side of the paper that's coated for inkjet. And then the other test that I do is I simply touch the corner of the paper to the inside of my lip and the moisture of my lip will stick to the coated side of the paper usually. Uh, we also have a Arista Duo Matte Lightweight. So this would be a very thin paper coated both sides. Uh, and here's Arista Ultra Premium Presentation Paper Matte, which is very popular as an inexpensive matte paper. Uh, Hanamuli has a... Uh, photo matte paper that is part of their range that is kind of an entry level range into their uh, brand. Is it, none of these are fine art papers. So all of these resin coated and matte papers, these are inexpensive papers. You can get a photographically realistic image on them, but if you go to a gallery or a museum, they're generally going to, if you show them your prints on these papers, they're gonna feel them and they're gonna go, you know what, why don't you come back when you have a real piece of paper? 
right? They can't sell these papers to collectors. Um, they're not archival. They contain optical brighteners. They're all made out of alpha cellulose uh, and not a high quality alpha cellulose. So they're, the paper is going to break down over time. The ink may not fade because the ink, you know, that we're using in these archival pigment printers will last a long time, but the paper will break down. So, so these are papers that people will use to proof. They'll use them to hand out images to their family and friends, but you're not going to necessarily, you know, take them to portfolio reviews and sell them to galleries and museums. So Eric, now, sorry, Eric, you have a few more questions regarding paper and paper profiles. Do you want to answer them now? Um, let me get through the paper part and then we'll, okay. then we'll answer them because some of those questions might be answered. So um, now we're going to get to um, the fine art papers, right? So this is, we're going to jump into that now. Um, and I also call these papers transformational. And the reason is that you're always going to get better quality out of these papers. And when I do my presentations on paper, I have images that I printed on a resin coated paper versus a fine art paper. And you can see that the depth and dimension is there. Um, so the kind of the first category I want to talk about is uh, what we call Baraita papers, Baraita. Now, um, uh, Baraita is one of the most mispronounced words we have in our vocabulary that we use to talk about uh, paper. So all it means is that it's, the paper has um, barium sulfate in it. That's what it means. It's barium sulfate. But, and the correct pronunciation is in fact barita. Now, some people will call it barita. Some people call it barita. Some people call it barda. I've even heard barita. They kind of give a little Harry Potter thing in it. And then some people just give up and call it burrito. But the correct pronunciation is in fact barita. And so, but it doesn't tell me anything. So when I, people that say, well, I use a Baraita paper, it doesn't help me. So for instance, Canton Baraita Photography 2, it's an alpha cellulose base, high quality alpha cellulose, not gonna break down as fast as the cheap papers, but that's wood pulp. Um, it's got a very smooth surface, it's very white. It has Baraita and a kind of a, a little bit of optical brightener in it. Um, now they have Baraita Photography 2 matte. This is the first matte paper with a, Baraita coating. It has no reflectivity from any angle. It's really a very interesting paper. Um, also very white, but it's a very matte surface, um, very different from uh, Baraita Photography 2. Um, then there's Hanamule, uh, Hanamule Photo Rag Baraita. So this is now 100% cotton rag base. Um, it's got a semi-gloss or luster surface, more of a semi-gloss, I think. It's, you know, when you start talking about surface, every surface, every paper has got a, kind of its own characteristic, but this is a gorgeous paper. It doesn't have any optical brighteners in it. Um, then we have Fine Art Baraita from Hanamuli, very different paper. So photo rag with the little register trademark, that means it's 100% cotton in Hanamuli's language. Uh, in if you see the word fine art, all one word with a capital F and capital A, that means the base is alpha cellulose. And this is a very white paper, still has barium sulfate, but also has optical brighteners in it. Um, it's also the paper that um, I would say when people come to me and say, I want a print that looks like a black and white wet darkroom print, this is the paper that comes closest to the look and feel of like an Ilford multigrade fiber base print. Uh, it also has a little bit of a slight kind of texture to the paper, which is interesting. And again, these are all images that when I shot these images, I knew what paper I was gonna print them on. Uh, so here's another paper from Hanumuli, a Baraita paper, fine art Baraita, just like the other one you see to the left of it, but it's satin and it's warm. And the pa paper surface is very smooth semi-gloss. I mean, these five papers are all really super different from each other. And then here's the last one. This is Moab Juniper Barita Rag, 100% cotton, very warm, not really, it doesn't have a lot of shine to it, very different surface. So here's 
six papers with the word variety in it, and they're all very, very different. So I'm going to kind of click through these really quick. Here's 100% smooth cotton matte paper. So matte papers don't have any reflectivity. Um, our Arista 100% cotton fine art papers, we have natural and bright white, bright white having optical brighteners in it, natural white no, with no optical brighteners. We also have it in the 210 GSM uh, version and a 330 GSM version. The 210 being, in fact, lighter weight than the 330. Um, Canson Infinity, uh, this is Arsh 88. This is one of my new favorite 100% uh, cotton matte papers from Canson. It is a very, very white paper without the use of optical brighteners. Canton has figured out how to make papers really white without OBAs. And yes, I keep on talking about OBAs. We're going to get to that. Um, Epson Hot Press Bright White, a very smooth matte paper with optical brighteners. And when you see our Shady 8 next to Epson in an environment where there's UV light, you'll see the Epson is brighter. But when you take it out of that, the Arch 88 ends up being brighter, which is one of the things I really like about it. And it came out about, oh, eight months ago, uh, mid last year. And it's uh, really, the Arch 88 is gaining in popularity simply because it is a very white paper without optical brighteners. And Arch 88, by the way, um, it's, um, Canson now owns the famous Arch mill in France. Canson has their own mill in Annonay, France, where they make Canson edition etching and other fine art papers. They both Hanamile and Canson, by the way, have been around for over 500 years. Um, and uh, so they have a very long uh, standing tradition in fine art paper making. Uh, and Arch 88 is actually a fine art silk screening paper that they've uh, adapted and uh, made for uh, accepting inkjet ink. So you can actually buy the same paper to do all sorts of other things with if you're doing silk screening and drawing and etching. And some people use it for historical processes and all that kind of stuff. So you can buy it uncoated as a fine art paper, and then you can buy it as Canson Infinity, which is has a coating that accepts inkjet ink. Um, Hanamili Photorag Ultra Smooth, very, very popular, very, very smooth paper, the smoothest of all the papers we have. Um, uh, Ilford also has smooth cotton rag, which is a beautiful paper, 100% cotton, no optical brighteners, super sharp uh, uh, inkjet receiving layer on it. And then, of course, Moab has Entrada rag, which is available as a bright white, a natural white, also available in a 190 or 300 GSM. And uh, if you get rolls of it, um, there's a single-sided version because all the other versions are double-sided, single-sided versions available in 290. So that's just a, and these are just brief. I mean, we've got over 200 papers available. So I've kind of chosen the highlights um, from the various brands in each of these categories. Uh, so now we're getting into 100% cotton, medium and heavily textured papers. So here's museum etching, very, very popular. One of the heaviest papers we have at 350 GSM. It's warm. It does not have any optical brighteners. It's got a beautiful texture. It was actually um, created in conjunction with a very famous landscape uh, nature photographer uh, named Stephen Johnson, who had a hand in its production. Um, Canson has... Uh, several papers with texture. This is Arsha's BFK Reeves Pure White. BFK Reeves being a very, very famous fine art paper. If you print on this paper, there are people out there in the world, in the art world, that go, wow, you're using BFK Reeves? I know that paper. It's one of the most well thought of art papers in the world. Uh, it's available in a pure white version. Um, and it's also available in a in a just what they call white, which is uh, what we would consider more of a normal uh, non-OBA uh, paper-based white. Uh, here's a Hanamili Photorag Satin. When I took this image, I know it was going on this paper. This is kind of an unusual paper in that it is matte, 
It accepts matte ink, but the ink has a bit of a reflectivity to it when you look at it at an angle. So it's technically also part of Hanamula's uh, glossy photo range of papers. If you look on their website, this paper is not under the matte range category. It's under glossy, even though it is a matte paper and it uses matte ink. But it was the perfect paper to, to print this image on. Um, it's William Turner, one of the most famous papers we have. Very warm, very heavily textured. It has the texture of 80 grit sandpaper. And again, when I took this image of this after hours depository Dropbox, I knew exactly what paper I was going to print it on. Uh, this texture is integrating with the texture in the wall. It's making the box seem uh, smooth by comparison. It is as three dimensional in real life as it is, as you see on your computer screen. Uh, then there's Canson Arsh, 80, uh, Arsh Aquarelle, uh, also a very heavily watercolor textured paper, uh, but it is also very, very white. So they've, Canson has included their pure white technology in this paper. And um, here's another after hour depository Dropbox in Silver City, New Mexico. You gotta really search for these things. These are the only two I've, I've taken pictures of. Um, I gotta get out more and actually find them because they're, they obviously used to all be on the sides of bank buildings, but those are generally have been taken out and replaced by ATMs. And now they're on the sides of buildings that used to be bank buildings. So you gotta kind of hunt for them. And then um, this is the last in this, um, this uh, range, which is uh, that I want to show, which is the BFK Reeves white. So it's got the same texture as the BFK Reeves pure white, but um, is not as bright a white. It's more of what we would consider our traditional non-OBA white. Um, and then uh, we have papers that have a more of an exotic base to them than 100% cotton. All the papers I've shown uh, in, uh, you know, in these past couple of categories, we're all 100% cotton. Hanamili has um, a natural range of product of which consists of bamboo, hemp, agave, and sugar cane. Uh, so these I would consider, you know, more exotic. Uh, they're designed specifically to be more friendly to the environment. They either by using less water or by the speed in which they grow. Um, this is part of their Green Rooster Initiative, which um, uh, is part of their range to produce product uh, pulp from, uh, that's either like in the case of agave is reclaimed from tequila production. Um, hemp for, you know, not no pun intended, grows like a weed. Uh, bamboo left unchecked, that stuff just, it'll grow three feet a day. They just keep on whacking it off and keeps on growing back. It grows very rapidly under the right conditions, and so does sugarcane. So these are four papers that are very, very interesting. Um, and certainly I have companies that are very environmentally conscious. And the, even though the cotton that the manufacturers use, um, that cotton is a reclaimed product. Um, these are even better for the environment, or at least less harmful for the environment than cotton is. Um, and then uh, Moab uh, has this paper that's actually made by Awagami for them called Moen Copy Unryu, which is at the base um, uh, from this paper and this other paper from Awagami. This is made, um, the pulp is made from Kozo. Kozo is a mulberry, Japanese mulberry tree bark that they literally strip the bark from the tree. They um, create the pulp out of it, and then it grows back. So the tree isn't destroyed in the process. So it's very environmentally friendly. It's also a very durable fiber. And we have papers that are very thick. And then we have also papers that are very thin and translucent. It's a very, very interesting range of product. And the images on these types of papers look very different uh, than our traditional Western images. Um, so just want to quickly just talk about this concept of optical brighteners that I've been uh, ranting on about from time to time. Uh, so optical brightener agents or OBAs, um, when they're in a paper, their purpose is to make the paper 
appear whiter or when it technically what's happening is when a UV light hits the paper, it reflects a bluer light. So it's very dependent upon the light you're viewing it under in terms of what it looks like. So um, there are some people that say, um, if a paper contains optical brightener uh, OBAs, you can't call it archival. Um, now, not everybody says that, but some people do, because uh, first of all, there's no definition in our um, industry as to what the word archival means. We all have kind of a conceptual idea of what it means, but the reality is there's nothing that says, if a paper is this, you can now call it archival. There are various levels of, of permanence, and for me, a paper that does not have optical brighteners is more archival than a paper that does, because if the paper does have optical brighteners, we know at some point they're going to fade over time. I mean, just look at every photograph in all of your shoe boxes, right? If, if, if it's from the 70s, 80s, or 90s, the base is yellow. And the reason is that the optical brighteners in the base have failed. The dyes and the, and the colors have failed. They, they tend to go magenta or cyan, right? So our color prints in the dark room were never really designed for archival permanence, yet we valued them still. Um, so for me, this issue of OBA, for some people, it's a big deal. Uh, for other people, they're like, I just like the way the paper looks. Now, to me, it has to do with that word predictability and control. Wow. So um, the reality is that a paper with optical brighteners will only look whiter if it's under UV light. To me, the whole point of discussing this is glass or plexiglass that you're using to present your print under. So I have this example here of Entrada, Moab Entrada rag bright white and an Entrada rag natural. Now, the bright white, if a paper has the word bright in it, it definitely has optical brighteners. And the issue for me is this. I have very famous photographers that have come to me and say with with absolute confidence that I'm printing on Epson hot press bright white or Entrada rag bright white or Hanamili photo rag bright white. I'm like, okay, why are you doing that? And they go, because I like the white point. I'm like, okay, how are you framing your print? And they go, well, I'm using museum glass. I'm like really? So museum glass from TrueView or Optium, which is a UV coated plexiglass is designed to block 99% of UV light. So when you put a piece of that glass over a print with optical brighteners, it looks just like the natural white paper, right? So you're making your print look yellow. So that's the main issue that I have with OBAs is that it's a false white and it only looks white if the print is being viewed under UV light. Otherwise, it changes dramatically. And for me, I would rather use a paper without optical brighteners than with. Um, oh, now that I did that, I can't. There we are. Whew. OK. Um, so here's an example. Uh, two papers. Uh, the one on the bottom is uh, Canson Aquarel. Uh, no optical brighteners. You see I'm using an LED UV flashlight. And you can see the white reflecting off of the board on the back, but not the paper. Whereas the image on the top, that's Hanumili Photorag bright white. And you can see my UV LED flashlight is reflecting off of both the paper and the board. So you're seeing how that UV light is reflecting off of the paper surface. Okay, so um, GSM. GSM means weight and not thickness. And this is kind of a big deal because every single box of paper um, has the letter, has a number and the letters GSM on. Now, most people don't know what that means. So the, technically what GSM is, it's called grams per square meter. It is the weight of the paper. It is not the thickness of the paper. The thickness is measured in mils or microns. So a mil is one one thousandth of an inch, micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. Now, GSM is how much it weighs. And so um, when people will ask me about paper, they'll say, well, I wanna see your selection of 310 
GSM thick papers? Well, wrong question, right? GSM is just the weight. And the reason why I use these two uh, papers as an example is that the Ilford Smooth Pearl is a resin coated paper and it feels much thinner than Innova Fabriano printmaking rag, which is a 100% cotton paper. Uh, cotton papers are have fibers that are woven like a fabric and they feel heavier. And when I show people these two images or these two prints and they feel them, it's a, a stunning what, when people say, oh my God, these two papers feel totally different. And when we're feeling papers, we call that the hand of the paper, right? So to me, it's important to feel the paper and see the paper before you actually purchase the paper. This way you kind of know what you're getting into. You can't tell by the box what's in there at all. So um, we have done something to help on our website. We have a world of inkjet paper comparison chart, and it's a comprehensive listing of every paper we carry. It's searchable and sortable, and it has the key features of each paper. Uh, we even continue to list discontinued papers because they're still out there, and we want people to see those specifications it also has uh, ratings and there are my ratings and it's how I've rated similar papers against each other. Uh, so I'm not comparing a resin coated paper with hundred percent cotton paper, you know, uh, and I'm taking into account technical aspects, uh, value, the price uh, and performance of the paper. So if you ever have any questions on the rating of the paper, let me know, it's my rating. Um, if I click over on this link, it takes you right to our website. And so this is the listing. And let's say you want to see all the 310 GSM papers. Um, you can click it once and it goes in order of um, the, you know, from uh, numerical order, you can go uh, sort it uh, uh, lowest to highest, highest to lowest. Uh, and then you can go paper thickness. So you can do, um, you know, the, uh, in terms of mills, lowest to highest, highest to lowest. And you can see also that when you do uh, the 310 GSM, for instance, uh, let's go to some of those. Uh, let's go to some of those papers. So you'll see that the 310 GSM papers um, do in fact have different thicknesses. And this surprises people. When I first came out with this chart, people were saying, hey, I love your chart, but all 310 GSM papers the same thickness. I go, no, it's not. And they go, yeah, it is. I go, no, it's not. And then I start showing them the papers and they go, oh, wow, that, that feels totally different, right? So it's the density of the paper. It's how it's made. Um, uh, and then let's say you wanted to see all of the canned, well, let's say, yeah, here, we'll type in Barita. So now you see all of the papers that have Barita. Um, and um, I also list under the opt, whoa, oh, under the optical brightener column if the paper has OBAs and Barita or just Barita by itself. So, um, and let's do a refresh on the page. So also under optical brighteners, you'll see if there's no check, the paper does not have optical brighteners because it doesn't always say on the box. Generally on the box, a paper will say does not contain optical brighteners. Um, it generally will not say does contain optical brightener. So created this chart so you have an easy reference to be able to see some of these features. Okay, so let's go back to here. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, so I'll discuss this slide and then we can an answer some questions real quick. So uh, a lot of people ask me, well, what paper should I use? So we have a service that I have been doing for 10 years. It costs $99 and it is called an inkjet paper psychotherapy session. And uh, whenever I say that, uh, some people laugh and giggle. 
Uh, it is really what I what a description says. Uh, I do them remotely via Zoom for people all over the world. I also do them by appointment in a retail store. And it really does answer the question, what paper should I use? Some of you might have gone through this with me. Um, and basically, you would bring, if you're going to do it in a store, you make an appointment with me, um, you'll bring a file, and then I will print it on the same printer, one printer, all with custom profiles on a bunch of different papers, and we will together discover which one you like the best. Um, this is a very personal decision. Uh, not everybody has the same taste, and people very much have a preconceived notion about what they think they like and don't like. Many people will come to me and say, you know, I, I love matte papers. I love the feel of matte papers, um, but their work doesn't really look good on matte paper. It looks better on a semi-gloss paper, yet they never tried it because they never thought paper really mattered. To me, this is the most important part of the process is understanding what paper you're going to print on. It's more than color management, it's more than your monitor, more than anything. It's what paper are you going to print on and does it match your unique artistic signature? For me, like I said before, every image I take, I know what paper I'm going to print on and it becomes part of my composition. I'm literally thinking paper, shadows, midtones, highlights, texture of paper. I'm creating an object in every image that I create. Okay, Janice, questions? Okay, there's quite a few. Hold tight. All right, okay. let me go back. All right, this one is from Richard. Any reason to think about paper differently for images recorded on film and scanned versus those captured digitally? Mm, no, to me, uh, a digital file is a digital file, whether it was captured on film, black and white. It's all about creating a unique artistic signature. The, uh, I think, you know, what my contribution here uh, in terms of the paper discussion is because I know the personality and character of paper, I can work that into a composition, but the film-based photography, digital, doesn't really matter. It's all personal taste, um, uh, but it also depends on what you want it to look like, right? If you, you know, shooting film and you want an image that looks like it came from a mini lab, then you're gonna print on a resin coated paper, right? But it would it will look better just like any digital file on a fine art paper. So I wouldn't make that distinction. Okay, great. We have, we have a few more. Okay. <laughs> this one is also from Richard, hey, has a few. Uh, can you recommend uh, papers for black and white images? Any off the top of your head? Um, so first of all, these are all really good and common questions. Um, uh, and uh, it again is all personal preference, right? So um, I have my personal preferences, right? I mean, I don't necessarily like images with large solid areas of black on matte paper, but I know a lot of people that do, right? Um, uh, if you want a print that looks like a black and white wet darkroom print, Hannah Mueller, fine art, uh, Barida is a beautiful paper, but I've had made beautiful prints. I mean, I can make a beautiful black and white print on any uh, inkjet paper. It all depends on your personal taste. You can't sell platine, uh, uh, Hunter Millie photo rag, Barida, two of our most popular papers, both print beautifully for black and white, but there aren't any papers specifically designed for black and white. In fact, Ilford had a paper years ago called Gold Mono Silk, which they were promoting as a paper for black and white. You know what? It was made for color. They just wanted to market something for black and white, but it printed beautiful color images too. So they really don't make a black and white inkjet paper. And I get asked for them all the time. Um, it all depends on your unique artistic signature. Do you have any recommend recommendations for what we could do if we'd like to present our artwork without glass or acrylic? Um, is there a good varnish that would work well on top of a paint? So um, there are three products we carry specifically for paper. Uh, the first one is Premier Art Print Shield. 
Uh, the second is Moab Desert Varnish, and the third is Tanamula UV Protective Spray. And honestly, they're all basically the same stuff. Some people like the Hanamule better because they like the nozzle on it. It is the more expensive of the three, but these are all products that are, design that are designed for protecting your prints uh, from environmental elements. So inkjet paper is just not a piece of paper. There's a lot of stuff on it. And the inkjet receiving layers um, are designed to accept inkjet ink. They're sensitive to that. So they absorb those, uh, those inks, dyes, or, or pigments. But that emulsion is designed kind of to suck everything, right? So, so uh, these products, when used properly, you should see no difference in your print uh, on matte paper. On semi-gloss papers, they're going to cure the surface a bit. They're going to harden it a bit. Um, so it might change the texture of a semi-gloss paper, but they're designed specifically for the purpose of protecting them from airborne contaminants and fading and, and UV light and stuff. So those are really good products. I am not a fan of presenting my images under glass because to me, it's all about the paper. I want you to fall in love with the choice of paper that I've made. So I really prefer to show my images without paper, but uh, without uh, any sort of glass or plex. And uh, these UV protective products are definitely appropriate. Now canvas, that requires a bit of a different treatment. Uh, there's roll-on product, Premier Eco Shield. We have uh, Hanamile, we have some other brands as well. Um, and that's really necessary because canvas, which you notice I haven't talked about much, I'm not a big fan of canvas. To me, it makes everything kind of look like a placemat. Um, and it's actually the lowest resolution and least archival permanent of all of the products we have. Um, I feel that an image on a piece of paper looks far better. But again, with canvas, you know, you can stretch it and put two nails on the wall and hang it up. So people like it for that reason. You don't have to mat it and frame it. But, uh, but yes, those um, protective sprays are a valuable tool in helping to preserve your images, especially whether or not you're going to present them without glass or plex. So, um, so one of the things that I find is astonishing is that uh, people are really willing to spend all sorts of money, how to use their camera, how to light, how to pose, how to do all sorts of things. But learning how to use their printer is like, you know, beyond them. I mean, they, they buy the printer, they plug it in, they figure it's going to put it on auto and everything's going to come out perfect. Well, it's not really the case. And it's kind of where I've carved out this little niche in the world for myself. Um, so it's as necessary to learn how to use your printer as it is how to use your camera. Uh, here's my slide talking about my, my class, which uh, um, Janice has put into the chat. So like I said, it's going to be a contact photo lab at the brewery. Um, so we're going to talk about printers and pro printer profiles real quick. So uh, both Canon and Epson make desktop printers and large format printers, and they're all great printers. I mean, people ask me all the time, what's better, Canon or Epson? And the reality is they both make beautiful printers. You know, the things to consider are what size do you want to make your prints. You know, Epson and Canon both have 13-inch wide printers. You know, these are printers that'll take 13-inch wide paper. They have printers that take 17. In large format, they have 24 and 44. So you kind of have to ask yourself things like, how, what size prints do I want to make? That's kind of the number one thing. Two, how much room do I have to devote to a printer? Because they do take up some desk space or floor space. How often will I be printing? What type of paper will I be using? How long do you want your prints to last? You know, do you want to use a dye-based printer, which are relatively inexpensive, or do you want to have a pigment-based printer, which is more expensive? Ink costs, your smaller printers are generally going to cost more per milliliter than the larger printers, your Canon Pro 300 and the Epson SureColor P700 printers that you see here. Uh, the inks, while they're less expensive because they're smaller ink tanks, if you calculate how much ink is in the tank, versus um, the price, you'll find that the ink cost in the smaller printers is twice as much as the 17 inch printers. So while the 17 inch printers are more money, 
and bigger, they're actually cheaper in the long run because you're gonna spend, spend less on ink, right, per milliliter. The amount of ink that's gets squirted on the paper is the same. It's about a milliliter per square foot, but your cost of ownership on a smaller printer is gonna be higher. Um, but then again, if you're not printing that much, you know, it maybe doesn't matter that much. Um, but then again, it's desk space. I have people that say, look, I have this much room. I don't have this much room. So then a smaller printer is the right choice for them. So nothing derogatory about the choices. It all depends on what you're doing. Um, in my world, saw a lot uh, more of the larger printers than the smaller printers. Uh, they uh, are faster. They're more efficient. They're designed to be repaired, whereas the smaller printers are designed to be replaced. Obviously, these take up more space. You can only feed one sheet at a time, but you can also print on a roll. I mean, there's some drawbacks, and um, but there's a lot of positives to it. And you see behind me, I have a Canon, uh, I, can, I have a Canon Pro 1000. I also have an Epson P900, but also to the right of me that you don't see, I have a Canon Pro 4100, my home office here. Uh, and I use that far more than I use the smaller printers. Uh, it's just, it's much faster, it's much more efficient for me to use the larger printer, even on sheets than it is the smaller printers. I use the smaller printers for smaller things. And then if I'm doing uh, workshops, you know, wherever, uh, it's much more, you know, it's much more convenient for me to take a smaller printer than it is a larger printer. So there's rooms for both. And we can, you know, you, you, any of you can email me and uh, get uh, my feedback on and advice on what printer's right for you. But our two main brands are Epson and Canon at this point, and, and they're all great printers. Um, so we have talked about custom paper profiles, and um, this is a really good example. I always show this in my classes as well. I have honestly um, uh, uh, done a bit of simulation here, but I think it will get the point across. So here's an image I took. It was digital infrared in Bodhi Ghost Town. And when I hold this print up for people, I say, how does it look? They go, it looks good. I'm like, really? It looks good. They're like, good. And I go, would you say it's great? Some people go, yeah, it looks great. Well, this image was printed on a sheet of paper on my Canon Pro 1000 with a manufacturer's generic profile. And then um, when we create a profile, you're printing out patches that look like this under very specific directions um, in terms of how to print. You just can't print it out of Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, you've got to go through, uh, you got to print out with no color management, but we don't have to get into it now. Uh, we have directions on our website for doing so. And then ultimately, even in a black and white image, this is what happens. I mean, that now is a neutral image. The original image, when you see the difference, you'll see the, the original image was green and cast, whereas the new one is neutral. And people are just blown away. And the reason is that the manufacturer's profile wasn't made for your printer. It was made for a printer. Like I said, it's going to, like going to Walgreens and getting reader glasses. It's not for your printer. I can tell you with absolute confidence that the two printers I have here, my Epson P900 and, and Canon Pro 1000, print differently than the same printers I have at the shop. There's a lot of variation in printers. And typically speaking, the human eye can see a deviation in color of 2% Delta E. Um, these printers can be five or 10% off and you can see that. And when people come to me and say, well, I'm getting a color cast in my black and white, it's generally because of a profiling problem. So some of you know this artist, Osceola Refetoff, who is a good friend of mine, and he gave me permission to use this image because it really um, is an example of uh, how we describe out of gamut colors. So Peter Bennett, this is gonna help answer the question for you. Um, so uh, this is what he saw on the screen on this image. And he's printing this image on Hanamule photorag metallic. And he was getting something that looked more like this, right? And this is where we start talking about the differences between these different technologies. Because the monitor is Adobe RGB 1998, but the paper can't print that color. 
So here's a very interesting graph. So this is a program, by the way, called Color Think Pro that I use all the time. It's a $400 program. You don't need it, but it allows me to visualize what's going on in situations like this. It allows me to take profiles and analyze them, paper profiles, monitor profiles, uh, color spaces like Adobe RGB 1998, et cetera. So this area right here is the color that was in his file. And he saw it on his computer screen because his computer screen, you know, was a, you know, a, you know, it's a, this is my BenQ monitor in Adobe RGB 1998. So those colors are in Adobe RGB 1998. He can see them, but this is the paper profile, right? So the paper profile, uh, does not in any way cover the color that he pushed out, right? So it's well within Adobe RGB 1998. And this particular paper is a metallic paper. It's Hanamili Photorag metallic. And it doesn't have a white. That's why you see that white point where you see L on top. It's down about 20%. It doesn't have anywhere near a white in it, right? So uh, this paper has got a, per, uh, a proprietary silver metallic pigment. So its color gamut is severely reduced versus other papers. And you could see the difference of what he saw in his monitor versus what could print. So now we talk about soft proofing, where we're taking that profile and loading it into Photoshop or Lightroom and then applying that to his calibrated monitor. And then the color looked really very much like what he was printing. So there are some technological differences here, uh, but it's understanding how it all works that will give you the predictability. But this is a really good example of him really pushing out the colors so he could see them on his monitor, but in no way was that paper gonna be able to render that color accurately because of the limitation of the paper's ability to render the color. Now, also this gets into, uh, in the printer driver, the choice of perceptual versus relative color metric. So um, what that uh, choice does, and it's kind of controversial because not that many people know what it means, but essentially those two things tell the print driver how to deal with colors that are out of gamut for the paper profile. So when you see the colors that are in the file that are so far out from the paper profile, Perceptual is going to look at those colors and do a calculation where it's going to bring them into gamut for the paper profile. Relative color metric is going to figure out where those colors are, calculate the, where the edge of the profile is and clip them out. Now, my experience, because I've done this with a lot of people, is that relative will render out of color, out of gamut colors like this brighter than perceptual. But most people use perceptual because it looks better for most photography. So it's, to me, the choice of which one to use is whichever one looks better. There isn't any right or wrong answer. And if anybody tells you one's better than the other, it really depends on the image and where those colors are and whether they fall in gamut or not. If they all the colors are in gamut for the paper, that choice does nothing, does absolutely nothing. But one rule to remember is that if you are gonna use relative color metric, you have to choose the selection for black point compensation. Otherwise your blacks will get all crushed up. So perceptual black point compensation doesn't do anything. Relative, it's really important that you choose it. So I think that I think this slide helps Peter in giving you kind of an understanding of what's what's going on. So if I used a photo black paper like Canson Platine, it's going to have a much bigger color gamut, right? Than this paper, matte papers have less color gamut than uh, semi gloss and luster papers do. But it doesn't mean I would choose always a photo black paper or a glossier luster paper because it has more color gamut. I Sometimes the texture and personality of the paper completely overrides color gamut to me. So it really depends on what you're going for. 
but these are the choices that we have in paper and why we choose certain papers over the other. So our custom paper printer profiling service is $99. And again, you would print out these patches. We use uh, this machine, uh, which is the latest technology from a company called Barbieri. It is the uh, best color profiling uh, machine in the world for paper and transparency and other textile products. And uh, we make the best profiles. Um, uh, and it's a very expensive machine. All it does is make profiles. So, and we have a very robust profiling service and we do them all the time and uh, we guarantee them. If you don't like them or see the difference, uh, we'll give you your money back. And I'm pretty confident in that because I've never had to give anybody their money back. Uh, everybody, when they look at them, sees a difference. Sometimes it's subtle, depending on the image. Sometimes it's pretty dramatic. Depends on what colors are in the image. But people always see a difference. And your images are going to have richer blacks, uh, more shadow detail, more depth, more dimension, and more accurate color, especially if the generic profile doesn't match your printer. Um, now, the last part of this, and wow, we're, we're making really good time. I really timed this well. Um, so uh, uh, this is my new statement. The light that you view your prints under is as important as the light you use to take your image. Everybody talks about in their images the quality of the light, the angle of the light, whether it's harsh or soft. Photography is all about light. Well, the light that you're viewing your print under is as important. So um, there are lots of ways of being able to accomplish this. Some are more expensive than others. Our standard, our standard light for viewing images is bright sunlight, high note. Okay, I do this all the time with people. They come to me and say, I just made a print. I'm here in my studio. My prints are too dark. I'm like, take it outside. You take your print, walk all over your house with it. It's going to look different in every room under different lighting conditions. The one place, and we're lucky to be in California because it's usually sunlight. We usually have unhindered sunlight. Um, bright sunlight, high noon is standard. Now, if you don't have that available, then you need a way to simulate that. So uh, you see on the left here, we carry the brand GTI. Um, these are standard viewing stations. And I literally, as I have traveled the country, doing inkjet paper, uh, in a world of inkjet paper seminars and talks, um, I will have one in my class. I bring the larger, the PDV 2020E with me. It's a portable viewing station. I cannot talk about color. I cannot talk about paper without having the right light to view uh, the prints under. So it's important for me to be able to have that available. Um, I have one in the store because the store, the light in the store is horrible. It's not the right light to be viewing and, and evaluating your prints. So I have one of those and look, these things run $900 to $1,400. You don't need one, right? Um, if you can afford one, great. It's, it's a great tool to have. Now I, in my studio here, you see behind me, this is a picture of my wall. I have um, track light up on top and I have found a brand of lighting. We don't sell them. And uh, I did order them. They've had problems shipping in California because of some laws governing what's in light bulbs and stuff, but they did ship me six of them. Uh, it's a company called Waveform. And, uh, and I got some BR30 bulbs that are 5,000K with a very high color rendering index of 95. So there's a couple of things that you wanna look out for when you're buying bulbs. Uh, 5,000K is the standard. Um, the lower the number, 3,000K, it's warmer. 6,500K is cooler. It's kind of your taste, but I find that compared to a monitor calibration, 5,000K looks best. And the reason for the color rendering index being high is that I was using bulbs um, that I got for 5,000K, but the rendering index was 80 and all the colors were drab and lifeless and the reds were kind of off. And when I got these bulbs, um, everything just kind of came alive. So um, I really recommend these bulbs over like just going to Home Depot and getting 5,000K bulbs. 
Um, if you, if that's all you got, then at least it's closer than uh, not having anything. Um, and we don't sell them. Waveform only sells direct, but I think they're a really good brand. And like I said, I got a bunch for myself and they're lighting my wall back here. Um, now the, and I also um, put them on a dimmer switch. So, and that's important. So you can adjust the brightness to match your monitor. Um, and then uh, I have some customers that have bought these other uh, lighting fixtures on the uh, on the right called from a company called Filex, F-I-I-L-E-X. Uh, they're about $200 and they've got two controls on them. They have a control for brightness and they also have a control for color temperature. So you can adjust it from like 3,000 to 5,000 to 6,500 and then you can adjust the brightness and it does take up a little desktop space, but they do uh, do a really good job in terms of uh, giving you at least something better than, you know, what most people have are really warm halogen bulbs or tungsten bulbs in their home, excuse me, in their homes. So lighting is important. And I would urge you to close the loop uh, with all of this stuff and take control of your environment. Your environment is very important. So um, it's 11.58. Wow. Okay. So thank you. That's it. That's the six steps to making perfect inkjet prints. And thank you to LACP for hosting this event.